Ladies and gentlemen, it is really a distinguished honor and a pleasure for me to introduce our next keynote speaker of the morning, Professor Jack Spence OBE. Professor Spence was educated at Pretoria Boys High School in South Africa and the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. He has lectured at a variety of universities in Britain, South Africa, and the United States, and was Professor of Politics and Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Leicester. During 1991 until 1997, he was employed as Director of Studies at the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Since 1997, he has been teaching at the Department of War Studies and has specialized in a postgraduate course on diplomacy. He has been visiting professor at the Universities of California, Los Angeles, Zimbabwe, Witwatersrand, Cape Town, NATO, and Pretoria. He is Chairman of the Advisory Council for the Association of the Study of Ethnicity and Nationalism, and he has been visiting professor at the Universities of California, Los Angeles, Zimbabwe, Witwatersrand, Cape Town, Natal, and Pretoria, as mentioned earlier. Professor Spence was awarded an OBE in the Queen's Jubilee Honors List in the year 2003. The lecture topic that he has chosen today is Human Rights, an Ambiguous Legacy. Please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Professor Jack Spence OBE. Thank you. Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Mark, thank you very much for those very kind words of introduction. I'm delighted to, can you all hear me? All right, I'm delighted to um, be here. I was pleased to get your invitation to speak to this most interesting conference. I'm most grateful to the organizers, and Mark in particular, and my former pupil, Felice, who it was a pleasure to meet once again. Uh, I have to say, I teach diplomacy in the Department of War Studies. I think I teach the only non-kinetic course in the department. The rest of my colleagues are teaching counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, nuclear proliferation. So I do rather stand out as a soft, woolly-minded liberal, but I defend my corner as best I can. Now, all I can do in this brief uh, time span of a 30-minute uh, presentation is to offer you some brief um, commentary on human rights issues, perhaps in due course we might translate this into a longer published version. Um, before I begin, let me just be anecdotal for a moment. In last week's Sunday Telegraph, uh, or rather last week's Daily Telegraph, there was a letter on Syria and human rights. And to my astonishment, I have to say, uh, the letter claimed that the dictatorship of Syria had been chosen to be a representative on the UNESCO committee that deals with issues relating to the implementation of human rights. Now, all right, I'm offering you a Western view, but I would have thought that one human right, which pretty well there is universal agreement on, is that one ought to be allowed to demonstrate peacefully in the square of a provincial city without being fired on by the army of one's government. But there it is. One speculates as to why uh, that delegate was elected or appointed to that particular committee. Was it simply Buggins' turn? You know, he was next or she was next in line for a committee position. Or was it uh, a belief, uh, misguided I think, a belief that soft power, diplomatic interaction with this delegation would somehow make them soften their view of what was appropriate for good governance in their home country. We may never know, or was it simply, understandably perhaps, a kind of reflex hostility to being apparently told by the West what was appropriate for Syria? Was that the reason for the election? It's worth exploring. I have no more information to offer you on that particular point. Now, it may be possible to get near universal agreement on what constitutes major abuse of human rights. I mean, the 
example that's often and rightly quoted is genocide. There's a special UN declaration on genocide. And if you read the UN and regional declarations on human rights, you will see a list of human rights that are appropriate. But it's much more difficult, having agreed in general on what constitutes human rights, it's much more difficult to get agreement on what constitutes a particular violation of human rights in a particular case, and what, if anything, should be done about it, how you can go about remedying or rectifying that particular abuse. In general, there might be agreement. There are, I think, certain human rights which most people would accept. I won't go into them. That's the subject, I think, of another discourse. But the problem comes when you're trying to find ways and means of asserting, defending, enhancing those human rights in a particular case. And I'll give you examples of that in a moment. I think what this illustrates, and that's why my title has ambiguity in it, what this illustrates is the continuing relevance of the age-old tension between realism and liberalism as theories of international relations and their differing impact on uh, practical polit political decision-making. I think there are times when realism and liberalism, in fact, do come together. They're not necessarily separate poles of intellectual discourse. Most of us, privately, are mixtures of liberal and realist assumptions and values. Liberal in the sense that we do pay some attention to the rights and needs and aspirations of others, but we also, clearly, being good realists, want to protect our own interest in survival. So we're mixtures, and this, I think, applies to political, the political enterprise as much as it does to the private one. What I think you can say with some authority is that the human rights discourse has deep historical roots. Now, I'm not going to <laughs> describe the historical evolution of that discourse in detail. You can go back to uh, theories of the just war, St. Augustine and Aquinas. There's an element of human rights debate in those just war theories. Um, nonetheless, there has been an evolution of sorts. It's often haphazard. The notion of human rights uh, is often more neglected in the breach than it is in the observance. But we can, for example, point to the Hague Peace Conferences of 1899 and 1907. Now, these were concerned uh, to try and make war, as it were, as it were more refined, uh, more humane, and more restrained, restrained uh, in its conduct. Uh, and particularly they were concerned, for example, with the treatment of prisoners of war. So there was a kind of element of human rights uh, concern expressed in those Hague Peace Conference treaties. Uh, the fact that they were grossly neglected on many occasions thereafter doesn't invalidate the strength of those um, uh, treaties and the strength of the clauses trying to promote human rights protection, even in the midst of the most bitter conflict uh, between states. By the same token, if you look at the covenants of the League of Nations, now this begins with the wonderful phrase, the high contracting parties. You know, that's a good old fashioned diplomatic phrase. In other words, peoples aren't involved here. This is the states, the high contracting parties. Compare the UN opening remark, we the peoples. We the people. Something had happened. It wasn't just rhetoric in the minds of those who devised those two great covenants, those two great constitutions of international organization. There was a sense in which those who defined the charter, the notion of we the peoples, had learned from the experience of the League that you couldn't ignore individual popular interest, popular commitment. But if you look at the League covenant, Understandably, after the horrors of the First World War, they were concerned with devising structures and processes for reducing the threat and the incidence of war. Nonetheless, you find some attempt to um, acknowledge the rights of colonial peoples who were still you know, part of the great empires of Western Europe. Hence, you get the mandate system, as it was called. I won't go into the detail. This was simply designed, in theory at any rate, to prepare former colonies for um, the uh, application of the right of national self-determination at some distant time in the future. In the League Covenant as well, 
there's a commitment to protect ethnic minorities, not so much individuals, but ethnic minorities, group protection. And this was uh, uh, e e exemplified in a series of League-sponsored treaties which became ultimately part of international law. Now come to the Cold War, human rights claims in, for example, the communist satellite states, these were frankly subordinated to the competing imperatives of East-West security. Any attempt to help the League at Poles, Hungarians, Czechs, in their revolt, and my God, they were revolts, against repressive government, ran the risk, quite clearly, in the eyes of both Moscow and Washington, ran the risk of starting World War III and escalating to that wonderful acronym, MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction. In other words, what's striking about the Cold War is that the great powers, and this is true of states in general, are profoundly conservative. What they want to do is to prefer um, protect their boundaries, protect their peoples, and provide them with security. And therefore, that does set some restraint on what they will do to each other, but it doesn't really restrain them from what they will do to their own within those boundaries. Nonetheless, even in the height, at the height of the Cold War, you can see some progress on the issue of human rights. The Helsinki Accords of 1975. Now, Basket Three, as it was called, was concerned with human rights, and it was designed to express a general aspiration on both sides of the Iron Curtain to an improvement in the human rights regime, particularly in the Soviet bloc, to promote the free flow of ideas and information throughout Europe. And the deal was perfectly straightforward between the West and the Soviets. Uh, Russian domination of Eastern Europe was formally recognized in effect, it was finally, if you like, <laughs> legitimized in the eyes of the great powers at least. In other words, both sides accepted the division of Europe into spheres of influence. That had always been the case since 1947. And the assumption was, we won't interfere in your sphere of influence, whatever happens to people in that sphere of influence, uh, if you don't interfere in ours. That was the deal. Now, in return for this major concession to Moscow, the West did succeed in getting human rights onto an international agenda. That was, I think, the real achievement of Helsinki. And that uh, issue has remained on the international agenda ever since, uh, particularly since the end of the Cold War. Certainly, if you think about Eastern Europe during the latter stages of the Cold War, think of that wonderful Polish trade unionist, Lech Walensky, and the massive effort he makes on behalf of his fellow Poles in the Gdansk shipyard. I mean, <laughs> he really is the hero of the post-Cold War world, or the collapse of the Cold War, it seems to me. He's never really, I think, perhaps received the acclamation that he deserves. Uh, he's a difficult character, I believe, but nonetheless, there he was, stuck in the Gdansk shipyard, defying the Polish Communist government, defying the Soviet Union. and. Um, in effect, that development in Poland in the early 80s was the first sign that the Soviet Union was imploding. And here we go back to realism, that great American realist. He lived to 100. He only died a year or two ago as a young student at the LSE many years ago, more years ago than I care to remember or tell you. I was um, not a pupil of his, but my God, I read his books avidly because I could see that here was a great realist mind at work. And what Kennan said in 1947 when there were Republicans in the United States saying, saying let's go for a roll up, let's roll up the communist government in Eastern and Central Europe and then we can impose a human rights regime more akin to our own. Kennan said don't do that, that way lies disaster and he was right, he said wait, all we've got to do, and my God, this is a realist view. We've got to contain the Soviet Union, keep them behind those Cold War boundaries. Do that, and eventually the Soviets will find they can't deliver, to use Goering's awful phrase, they can't deliver guns and butter, whereas the West can and did and still does. And that will mean that the Soviet Union will eventually collapse, the empire will disappear, and they'll have to come to terms with reduced status. So Kennan was right.
And that was a realist doctrine. It was based on very orthodox, rather humdrum conservative values, skepticism about possibility of transformation. It was based on prudence, what you can and couldn't do. It was based, if you like, on um, a recognition that there were limits to what any government anywhere, even a superpower, could legitimately do without bringing into play the possibility of conflict between the great powers. Now, what this particular episode, uh, the end of the Cold War, suggests is that the halting, somewhat haphazard progress on human rights issues um, is to some extent governed, not entirely, but to some extent governed by changes, important changes, not always perceived as changes, in the external environment, in the external constellation of world events. When the constellation, when the stars, as it were, are properly related to each other, if you like, then you do get significant, if largely unforeseen, changes in human rights regimes. One example from my own country, apartheid. Apartheid and all its ills, for example, would not have ended in the way that it did. And while I'm here, I may as well give some publicity to the fact that a colleague of mine, David Welsh, and I did a book last year called Ending Apartheid, where we tried to look at the human rights issue as a factor in bringing about change in South Africa, engineered by the outside world through NGOs of all kinds, governments, diplomats, etc., etc. And I think what, what was interesting about apartheid was that it wouldn't have ended when it did, how it did, um, wouldn't have resulted in a painful, almost superhuman process of negotiation over four years. 1990 to 94. I mean, there were ups and downs, there were breakdowns, and yet somehow de Klerk and Mandela stuck together and got a decent outcome, got a decent constitution. And what that suggests is that apart from changes in the outside world, because the end of the Cold War meant that de Klerk could say, look, the Russians aren't going to come marching across the Limpopo, so cheer up, people. It's not as bad as you think. And Mandela could say, look, if we go on trying to fight a war of liberation, we're not going to win, we're not going to lose, but we may ultimately inherit a wasteland. Therefore, let's talk. In other words, both sides in that extraordinary conflict, which went on for so long, finally recognized that the costs of going on, preserving apartheid, fighting a war of liberation, exceeded the costs of coming to the conference table and compromising. Uh, that was a, an illumination which led to that great uh, constitutional moment. And um, uh, I think what one has to recognize here is that diplomats, British, American, uh, Western diplomats, Russians, all quietly, surreptitiously played soft power politics, putting pressure on the protagonists whenever it looked as if the whole thing would collapse in a heap. But what's important here in any human rights fundamental change and very often we don't expect this. Who expected the Arab Spring? Come on. I mean, how many of us really sat back a year ago and said, in March there'll be great things happening in Libya, Tunisia, and Egypt? Maybe my Middle East colleagues did. I certainly didn't. Um, but I think what I'm stressing here is that changes in human rights regimes, fundamental, unexpected, um, uh, interesting, exciting changes occur uh, partly when you have, coincidentally, the emergence of a new risk-taking leadership. You've got to have a leadership who says, my God, I'll take a risk. That Polish trade unionist took a risk. My God, he did. De Klerk took a risk. Mandela took a risk. You get this combination of internal and external factors promoting sudden, unexpected change in the external environment, and that leads to sudden debate, argument, popular demand for a change in the existing human rights regime. Yet another example of um, the play of the contingent and the unforeseen, as a great historian, H. A. L. Fisher, once said, he said, rather interestingly, he said, you know, when you're thinking about policy, try and take into account what he called the play of the contingent and the unforeseen. Recognize that whatever you do, however well-intentioned, however well-planned, <laughs> whatever you do, you're going to have unintended consequences which you've got to cope with somehow. That's 
a law of politics, I think, which is absolutely right. Um, but I think one such great event, horrific as it was, which in a sense put human rights on the agenda, at least if not much was done initially about them, was of course the Holocaust and the horrors suffered by European Jewry. Uh, that incidentally helped paradoxically to promote worldwide antipathy to apartheid. And the process established that horror, that revulsion, A, against what happened to Jews in the Holocaust and what was happening to Africans in South Africa, that uh, led to the establishment of a new norm for governing relations between states. And that norm was racial equality, racial equality. And it was very difficult, it was impossible thereafter for any government really to publicly, politically justify racism in either domestic or international discourse. I mean, just consider, to take our, perhaps our, you may think a trivial example, UEFA and Seb Blatter saying, well, if people make racist remarks on the football field, okay, they come off the football field, they can shake hands and forget it. What nonsense, what rubbish. He quite rightly has been hammered for saying that. So even on the football field, there's a recognition that you don't make racist remarks against your opponents, even if you've been kicked by your opponent, either by accident or by design. But of course, that norm of racial equality, okay, more honored in the breach than the observance very often, that's been enshrined, as you know, in a number of major declarations of the UN and other bodies, not to mention in individual domestic jurisdictions, such as Britain, for example, and the European Union. We have a court, uh, we, we, we subscribe to the Court of Human Rights in Europe. It causes all sorts of problems for our judges and for our politicians, but we signed up and we have to obey it. Now, at the end of the Cold War uh, seemed to herald and this was the phrase used, a new world order. This would be based on principles of a vote-free security, a veto-free security council in the United Nations and the um, global spread of democratic government and free market economic principles. Now, to some it seemed that a true marriage of realism and liberalism had at last arrived, that these two great opposed concepts of organizing society and organizing thought about the world had somehow managed to coincide, had come together. Realism, in the sense that the doctrine of containment of the Soviet Union had done the trick. It had forced the Soviet Union to accept defeat in the ideological struggle with the West, both at home and abroad. Liberalism had triumphed insofar as orthodox Western ideas of what constituted good governance and sound economic development appeared to, set, to be set to usher in the creation of a genuine international community of states and a, a community in which human rights observers, observance would become well nigh universal. And this new global dispensation, hopefully brought about by the end of the Cold War, it was argued would be reinforced by the seemingly limitless impact of globalization. This, it was argued, would force states into increasing inter interdependence in every sphere, economic, political, and social. New means of rapid, almost instantaneous communication would be possible, both public and private. And this would give the individual, and goodness knows we've seen this happen in the last five or six years in Iran, in the Middle East, in North Africa, this would give the individual this is so interesting, these new means of communication, social media as they're called, this would give the individual some capacity to help, not entirely achieve, but to help shape his own destiny. And this was of course reinforced by real-time media coverage of, uh, of the world's ills, and um, this in turn would force even the most autocratic government to pay some attention to the parlous condition the plight of their own citizens. Just this morning in the paper I read as I came here that the president of Yemen has resigned. Well, ask yourself why. Didn't the Arab Spring have something to do with that? Didn't communication have something to do with that? Didn't, have, didn't the desire for some decent human rights dispensation have something to do with that? So, so far so good, you could argue. Now soft power, of which if I may say so, 
both public and cultural diplomacy are obvious examples. Soft power, you could argue, seems to promise more than old-fashioned coercive diplomacy of the kind that had worked, for example, in the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And here I come to the notion of ambiguity, which is implicit in my title. First, clearly, the term human rights, or the concept of a human right, is open to a variety of interpretations. Uh, while acknowledging that it is firmly on the international agenda, it can't be scrubbed out. It's there. It has to be taken into account. Politicians, if nothing else, have to pay lip service to it. There can be, and there is, legitimate disagreement about what constitutes human rights. Now, in the West, we've tended to say human rights are very clear, very limited. They relate to freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of movement, freedom of religion. They don't say much. Western doctrines of human rights don't say much about social and economic rights. Whereas, if you look at the declarations of human rights in Africa, in Asia, there you do find an emphasis on basic needs and satisfying basic needs. Now, it's, it's easy for us in the West, who by and large find our basic needs satisfied, it's easy for us to criticize governments who say it's more important to think about people eating properly, having warmth, having comfort, having shelter, have a modest degree of subsistence. It's, it's better to, to recognize that that's important for them um, and not be too concerned with constitutional niceties. Now, this debate is ongoing. Whether you can ever agree on a universal declaration of human rights, which applies to everybody, everywhere, is a matter of great debate. I'm not sure you can, but you have to make the effort. And nowadays, you do have to make the effort, because not to do so makes life difficult for you, as various leaders in North Africa and the Middle East found to their cost. Uh, I do part company, however, I do part company with those American neoconservatives who moved by both reasons of state, realism if you like, and by an aggressive liberalism, they wished to spread the values of the so-called city on the hill, the beacon of American enlightenment to the rest of the world. This strikes me as both intellectual and political arrogance. And ultimately, um, it, uh, it, it, it makes intervention um, really undesirable, witness events of the lost decade in Iraq and Afghanistan. And here, the notion of constitution of unexpected consequences has relevance. The question, how can we best, how can we best promote human rights from the outside? What role for external actors? In other words, what can be said in favor of liberal humanitarian intervention? Uh, particularly if it involves the use of military force and or economic sanctions, particularly if it involves brushing aside sovereignty. In other words, it breaches, if you go down this route, the great Westphalian principle of non-intervention. Now, in the past, as you know, the Westphalian uh, principle of sovereignty and non-intervention have provided rather haphazardly and precariously, a degree of international order. And human rights, by and large, though not entirely, have become a poor second in the lexicon of official state discourse. In other words, you could argue that in the past, by and large, justice, justice for minorities, for individuals, their human rights, they were sacrificed on the altar of security. But the emergence of new norms designed to defend, assert, and enhance uh, human rights um, has meant that politicians have to scramble, amid all their other concerns, to seek ways and means to implement, implement that norm. And here, of course, we have this new doctrine, which has become, in a sense, another norm of international relations. There is progress in international politics. That's a good liberal view. It's open to argument, but I think there is. Um, here you have this new norm, relatively new, the so-called doctrine of the responsibility to protect. Now, this is the most ambitious attempt to find effective and legitimate justification for intervention in a country which is grossly abusing human rights. Um, it's designed, if necessary, to brush aside the sovereignty of, a, of an offending state, 
and to intervene directly to try and regime change and get a decent human rights structure into place. Now, it could be argued, of course, that the responsibility to protect is more honored in the breach than the observance, but nonetheless, it's there as a norm. Now, in this country, we have laws against uh, all sorts of crimes, those crimes are still committed. That doesn't invalidate the notion of law. The law is still important. Most of us obey it, not just for self-interest, but because we recognize that the law has almost a kind of mystical and significance. And if you think about the responsibility to protect and the way it's been implemented, think of Bosnia, think of Sierra Leone, think of Kosovo, think of East Timor. In all these cases, the Westphalian door protecting domestic jurisdiction was hurled aside and the key was thrown away. Moreover, and um, this is uh, something of a major liberal advance. This is the most interesting bit of it, I think. Bosnia and Kosovo became, in effect, protectorates of the external, of the international community, rather like wards of court in the English legal system. You know, if children find themselves without parents or parents abusive, a judge can declare that they are wards of court and will take responsibility for seeing that their welfare is protected. Now, in a way, what's happened in Bosnia and Kosovo is that the EU and the UN have taken responsibility for helping these states to develop their political and economic arrangements. Um, just think of another development in the human rights lexicon. Think of the widespread, now we all take it for granted, think of the use of election monitors. These days, a state going through regime change, having elections free and fair for the first time, will invite election monitors to come in and supervise. I mean, I remember uh, voting in the first 1994 free election in South Africa, standing in a long queue in Durban. Extraordinary experience. Blacks, whites, Asians, coloreds, laughing, joking, voting, <laughs> eating pies and ice creams, being sold to some bright young by some bright young entrepreneurs. And I thought at the time, this is important. The world was watching these elections. This is important because it somehow symbolizes that some fundamental changes have taken place and it gets external approval through external monitors. So symbols matter in international relations and free elections are more than just symbolic, but they do have symbolic significance nonetheless. Perhaps another way of trying to examine the issue of when it's appropriate or not to intervene is to make a distinction between man-made disaster, that's real abuse by individuals of other individuals, and that caused by the unpredictable force of nature, earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, etc. Now, in most cases, for these natural disasters, the international community responds quickly and, and effectively, or by and large effectively. Really, trouble is, do you hear much about the aftermath? That's because the media uh, are consumed by voracious interest in the here and now, and we never hear what in fact happened months later following intervention in trying to help a country going through a natural disaster. And this is a good liberal response. This is a good liberal response, par excellence. Realist considerations don't really enter into that kind of support for a country going through some ghastly uh, national uh, disaster. You might describe this not so much as the responsibility to protect, but as the duty to assist. Uh, that's the phrase used by someone I have a great admiration for, a Bulgarian political scientist who works at the Sorbonne in Paris wrote a chapter in a wonderful book which you should all read called Human Rights and Human Wrongs, where you have every conceivable argument for and against human rights being presented. And Todorov is a great skeptic. He's a conservative. He's prudent. He's a realist. He says, well, I'm not sure about responsibility to protect, but I do acknowledge, he says, that countries have a duty to assist. That's more humdrum, more down to earth. It doesn't get the kind of great publicity that a resolution involving responsibility to protect us. So when you get gross abuse of human rights, there are 
competing incentives and constraints. Uh, but what is especially interesting, I think, is how uh, liberal principles combine uh, with realist views in, in promoting state practice, uh, even when national interest is not at stake. Um, now, the best example of a government trying to formalize, trying to give expression to a doctrine of intervention, which would be appropriate in all cases, was that extraordinary doctrine of international community put forward by Prime Minister Blair in 19, 1989, celebrating NATO's 50th anniversary in the middle of the Kosovo crisis, which didn't look like much of a celebration at the time, it's true, but um, there he was in Chicago offering his doctrine of the international community. He was trying, uh, and, and I can tell you an anecdotal story here, my head of department then, Sir Lawrence Frieden, very distinguished academic, was phoned up by Blair's office two days before Blair went to Chicago. And the office said to Laurie, look, he's got to make a big speech in Chicago on intervention. For God's sake, can you write something which he can deliver? And Laurie went for a walk on Wimbledon Common with his dog. <laughs> he came back and he wrote this extraordinary doctrine, which Blair accepted with a few minor changes. And it became, as it were, the official doctrine of the then Labour government. Now, what were, what were Blair's criteria for intervention? First of all, he said, be sure of your case. Be absolutely sure that gross abuse has occurred, genocide or something so appalling, so dreadful, that you can really make a case in moral terms for intervention. Uh, secondly, have you exhausted all diplomatic options? Have you tried every mechanism of soft power available and they haven't worked? Okay. Thirdly, and this is very important, can a military operation to intervene to stop this abuse, can it be practically mounted? Is the strategic context appropriate for such intervention? Fourthly, are those who intervene willing to stay for the long term? Finally, almost as an afterthought, almost as an afterthought, Blair said, and of course, good old realist that he is at heart, the national interest, the national interest has to be involved. Here you get a, an attempt, valiant attempt, I think, to merge realist and liberal principles with respect to this new doctrine of intervention. Now these criteria seem sensible enough, but they are very difficult to apply um, in harness. Uh, I mean, the difficulty is getting support at the UN in a resolution through the Security Council. You are meant to go through chapter six soft power attempts, mediation, arbitration, go to the International Court, good offices, use of the Secretary General, all those are good soft power techniques. If they fail, you then go to the Security Council and ask for uh, a resolution to employ sanctions or force. And as we know, there are countries in the world, Russia, China, even my native South Africa these days, who are non-interventionists by and large. And they've got good and bad reasons for being non-interventionists. So it is very difficult to get a re resolution through the Security Council. Take Kosovo. There was, I think, widespread belief that intervention in Kosovo was desirable, both for moral and for political reasons. I won't go into them, but there was a widespread belief that this was justified. In other words, you had the bad paradoxical situation that you could intervene in Kosovo um, on, uh, on, if you like, uh, uh, legitimate grounds, you, you know, that that exercise was regarded as legitimate intervention because the cause was good, but it didn't enjoy legal authority, didn't get a resolution in the Security Council. And uh, that, I think, is you know, one of the paradoxes, one of the difficulties reconciling legality and legitimacy when intervention comes up. I suppose the most difficult part of a human rights enforcement action concerns the appropriateness of the strategic context. How does one disarm human rights abusers using orthodox military means? I puzzle about this, ladies and gentlemen. I haven't got a clear view on it, and I don't know either of the two cases personally, but I have colleagues who do. Uh, 
and there's a division of opinion on this, could we have stopped the genocide in Rwanda by orthodox military means? Well, it's a good question. Think about it. Could we have stopped the massacre in Yugoslavia at Srebrenica? Could that have been prevented by orthodox military intervention? Big questions and hard to know what could have been done. In other words, what this says is that in trying to enforce human rights regimes to change a country's abusive practice, then you've really got to have a context, a military context, in which your strategy has a chance of being successful. And at that time, I don't think the UN, in either case, had a strategy which could employ force successfully, quickly, and appropriately. Um, but bear in mind that intervention is possible and does take place. It has to have a fortunate conjunction of circumstances. Consider Libya. Consider Libya. There is the clear evidence, Blair's point again, clear evidence that Gaddafi's lot were bent on massacring people in Benghazi. They were marching on Benghazi. It was the real possibility that a lot of innocent folk would be killed. That was a real prod in the international community's side to get something done. Secondly, you had Arab League support for a UN resolution. Thirdly, they had Arab League support for a NATO imposition of a no-fly zone. Fourthly, there was clear internal hostility to the Gaddafi regime. There was even an attempt by the African Union to mediate, which failed. And that, if you like, gave the excuse for something more positive. And finally, the other decisive factor, which partly explains why the success occurred, if it is successful, we don't quite know what the long-term outcome will be, was that there was an agreement by everybody involved in the outside, on the outside, there would be no boots on the ground. There'd be no boots on the ground. And that was fundamental. Um, in other words, you could have British special forces running about arming rebels with weapons, training them in military skills. Nobody knew where they were or what they were doing, but they were there, believe me. But that wasn't boots on the ground in the sense that there are boots on the ground in Iran and Afghanistan. Um, compare Syria. What do we do about Syria? How do, we, how do we go about helping the opposition in Syria? assuming that that's what we should to do, should do, assuming that that's what we want to do. Um, getting that fortunate conjunction of circumstances which applied in the Libyan case is clearly nothing like uh, as easy. Um, in other words, you might want to follow a rather more profoundly conservative strategy here. And some of my colleagues believe this and argue the case very strongly. In other words, people say, look, when you have popular uprising against a repressive state who are undermining human rights, the best strategy in these circumstances is to leave them to it. Let them get on with it. OK, duty to assist, sure. NGOs can come in and do what they can to provide food, sustenance, whatever is required. You may smuggle arms into the opposition, sure, but don't go in as we've gone into Afghanistan and Iraq. Leave it to the locals. Okay, at the end of the day, you'll have winners and you'll have losers. Yemen's a win-win at last. Took a while. Uh, and if you have losers, well, so the argument goes, a good conservative argument, life's unfair. At least you avoid the errors that occurred, if you like, in Iraq in particular. Um, let's take Iraq, finally, as an example of what happens when you do intervene for all sorts of reasons, one of which was clearly regime change, no question. Um, now, my very conservative colleagues, and I feel this view myself sometimes in the small hours of the morning when I brood about these matters, would say, look, okay, Saddam was a monster. He killed arbitrarily lots of people. My God, he really messed up Iraqi human rights. But he's not immortal. He wasn't going to last forever. Sooner or later, he would have gone by one means or another. And what we forget so often when we think about intervening in places like Iraq in defense of human rights is that societies change. 
imperceptibly, new leaders appear, opposition movements grow up, and most of us don't know this is happening. Diplomats who live there and work there may, and may tell their governments this is happening, but you know, most of us aren't aware of these subtle changes taking place in societies which suddenly produce you know, people power in places like Egypt and Tunisia. And the argument is, leave it to local events, to local people to sort out their own destinies, uh, because sooner or later, wicked rulers will be gone, will be forced out. And then they say, if you really want a criterion for success or failure, okay, Saddam would have survived if we hadn't invaded. Uh, he would have killed many more people during that period of survival, sure. How many people have been killed post-invasion? You know, If number of deaths is the criteria, it seems to me Iraq is not you know, a, good, a good testimony to that. I remember during the first Gulf War, 1991, a journalist asked Paddy Ashdown, a very distinguished um, uh, British politician, ex-soldier, or ex-naval officer, I think, special boat service, why Kuwait, he said, why are you going on about the wickedness of Iraq invading Kuwait? There's so many other places where equal wickedness is occurring and you're not doing anything. Isn't this double standards? And Paddy Ashdown said, because you can't do everything, doesn't mean you shouldn't do something. Because you can't do everything doesn't mean you shouldn't do something. And I, I remember that phrase because it partly justifies not being able to do very much about Iran or about Zimbabwe. We've done nothing except try and apply sanctions in both cases, and they haven't worked. In my more extreme liberal radical moments, when I'm really feeling non-kinetic in the Department of War Studies, um, I say, look, with Iran and with Zimbabwe, why not try soft power? Why not say to the Iranians, OK, you want a bomb, you're going to make one. Difficult to say they can't have one. We've got one. Why shouldn't they have one? Good, liberal, rational argument. We'll help you. We'll demonstrate how to d devise command and control systems which will strengthen your deterrence posture vis-a-vis -vis states in the region. And then we'll flood you with goods, trade, investment. All we'll, we'll, we'll overwhelm you, smother you with goodies of one sort or another. Soft power, see what happens. I don't see any government in the West doing that, engaging in that. But, you know, maybe the time has come for innovative solutions to these problems. You know, what are we going to do about Iran? Say that tomorrow we're told by the Iranian government, yes, we have a bomb and we have a delivery system. What are we going to do? Bomb them? Let Israel off the leash? What are the consequences of so doing? If we don't do anything, isn't that humiliating? You know? So maybe you've got to find another way of doing things. I think I'll bring this to an end, actually. Um, I've tried to cover all the cases I can. Um, um, the only other point I'll make, right by way of conclusion, is that, OK, we may not have a clear definition of what constitutes universal human rights. I suppose one universal human right, which everyone would acknowledge, was the right to life, but then capital punishment. How do you deal with that? Um, last night I was, I shouldn't tell you, I was sitting in a pub. I'd done six hours of seminars. And Felice will tell you that occasionally I visit a, a pub in the Aldrich and celebrate the end of six hours of teaching. And I was going through my notes for this talk. And suddenly I heard a conversation going on behind me. Six young people talking. I thought, my God, these are PhD students from King's. And they talked to me. And I said, well, well who are you? What are you? They said, uh, we're, we're a, we're a non-governmental non organization concerned with human rights, and in particular, the death penalty. And I thought, well, that's a good omen for today. At least you know, <laughs> I've come from the world of practice to the world of theory, which was encouraging. Um, so the only last point I would make is that, although we can't agree, perhaps, on a complete universally acceptable definition of human rights, there are some, I think, children. I mean, don't most societies value children? Don't most societies see children in particular, and if I may say so without you know, sounding patronizing, 
don't most societies recognize that children and women are innocent? The notion of innocence, you know, we seem to have lost sight of. Innocence is important. It's people have a right to be innocent and not to be put upon by those who don't uh, accept that right. So maybe you can look about and find particular rights which most countries, most cultures would accept. Okay, I know that in West Africa, in Liberia, you know, children were used as soldiers against their will, you know, sure, sure. But by and large, there is some kind of universal consensus, isn't there, that there are certain rights, difficult to enforce, but you have to recognize them as important. And, you know, as a good liberal, I, this is my very last point, I detect a kind of haphazard, faltering movement towards some theory, some practice of what you can call good governance. I just caught the gist of your last speaker, very interesting on the World Trade Organization. Here's an organization you know, trying to apply good principles of economic governance, as I understand what he was saying. I hope I haven't done him an injustice. But isn't there a sense in which you feel the world is desperately trying, haphazardly, falteringly, to find ways and means of establishing structures, processes, which will somehow diffuse conflict, prevent it from occurring, when it does occur, deal with it, and cope with the aftermath and the consequences. That does seem to be the thrust that we can detect in international politics right now. And goodness knows, it's a long, hard haul. and won't be easy, finally, to realize or to put into practice. But one thing you can say with uncertainty is that if you do move in that direction, if those institutions, structures, and processes do take root eventually, then a human rights regime will have to be a key part of it. How precisely is another matter. That's uh, perhaps a case for another lecture, but I've overstayed my welcome, so I'll stop at that point, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Tony Blair made many mistakes uh, with this to acknowledge it. So he <coughs> but he, he did spot something very important. He recognized that you know, we really have to try and find a, a strategy, a doctrine, as he called it, for dealing with gross abuse of human rights. And that doctrine he enunciated, that extraordinary mixture of liberalism and realism, you know, was, was, was a evidence of a, a man who there at the right time, at the right moment, but who had the intelligence to recognize that something had to be done and did as best he could with the assistance of my good friend on the street. Doesn't matter where you take the evidence or the advice from, as long as you translate it into practice. So I think the principle is sometimes quoted, come at the hour, come at the man or woman. Come at the hour, come at the man or woman. And one can only hope that when the hour does come, some crisis, some great event, 
politics of a man or a woman there and outside, you will have the, the brains, the skill, the intelligence, the, the, the courage to take a risk and back something that might otherwise be left brushed aside. That's the best answer I can give you. It's, it's luck, it's intelligence, it's being there at the right time, in the right place, and having enormous self confidence. And if you look at the, what is extraordinary about the Labour Party in this country is that it fought at least four wars during the, what, 11 years it remained in office. I mean, that's a pretty odd record for a Labour Party, which traditionally is the great peacemaking, peace-loving party, always hostile to war, always hostile to the military. Blair's changed all that. Blair says there are wars which just would, which have to be fought. And he had some success. I mean, Sierra Leone, I think, was a, was a success. Uh, and he was partly responsible for that with a lot of help from his African friends in West Africa. So, you know, you've got to be giving credit. East Timor, he was involved in that. It seemed to work. It was a success. Iraq and Afghanistan, well, the jury is still out on that. The jury is still out on that. And um, I, I hesitate to make a prediction. Anyway, questions? Yes, please. I'm told I must use the microphone because these brave words of wisdom are being recorded. <laughs> dear me, dear me. I wasn't aware, but still. Um, not to worry. Um, the lady has asked about gender equality and the fact that uh, very often it's more honoured in the breach, again, than the observance, uh, despite conventions of one kind or another. Uh, difficult here, and again, I'm not an expert, and I hesitate to really make any profound statement, or any statement for that matter. Here, as you were rightly saying, we, we come up against cultural relativism. Your phrase, a good one, cultural relativism. There are societies, there are cultures, where the role of woman is clearly marked out to be subordinate, to be subordinate. And all one can say, I think, is that I don't see intervention taking place of a massive military kind to rectify the status of women in societies where this is the case. If intervention does take place, it will be because not just of that particular denial of a human right, but because of denial of other human rights. I'll tell you a story which might help. Uh, you, the Arab Spring, this extraordinary event, which we're still trying to come to terms with, trying to understand, I think it is an event of major, major significance. It's equivalent to 9-11, it's equivalent to the end of the Cold War. And people like me are wrestling with it, trying to work out what its immediate and long-term consequences are. And remember, it all began, as these things so often do begin, with one isolated incident. That poor young man in Tunisia who burnt himself to death, because I think he was being bullied, horribly bullied by police authorities, and that just sparked off. That suddenly acted as the spark that lit the fire of opposition. And so often in international relations, it takes one man or woman to do something quite extraordinary to bring about fundamental change. Prinkip in 1914, assassinating Archduke Ferdinand. You know, That was a pretty important event. One man. It would have happened anyway, no doubt, sure. But one man was the catalyst. Now. I was impressed and struck by the fact that in Saudi Arabia, some months later, several young women got in their motor cars and drove around. I thought, good for you. 
And that was my personal reaction. Good for you. Is this the catalyst? Is this suddenly going to make the Saudi government say, well, come on, we've got to at least do something about the rights of women in our society? Uh, they were not, I'm told, prosecuted. They, I think, got a warning and were let go. But, you know, I thought <laughs> it's that kind of little event which might have unforeseen, unpredictable consequences. So, you know, all I can say is that at the end of the day, um, and here I go back to the rather conservative position that I adopted towards the end of my talk, in a way, perhaps, these things have to be left to locals. I'm struck by the fact, you must have been struck by the fact, that looking at the television night after night on Egypt, the number of young women involved in those protests, I found that enormously encouraging, which led me to believe, and I think I still believe this, that any new political dispensation in Egypt will, um, will have to recognize, you know, that women have rights, as men do, uh, and must be recognized as having rights. I don't think you can ignore that protest, which was so obvious on the screen. Lots of In Iran, in that first wave of protest, that young woman who was killed, who became a kind of symbol, an icon of resistance. I mean, that may be the way to go, you see. That may be events of that sort may lead in unpredictable, haphazard ways to fundamental change in the status of women. That's the best I can do, I'm afraid. Yes, oh, gosh. <laughs> yes, please. One more. One more, righto. Sorry, yes. We, who would like to, lady there, yes, please. <laughs> Why don't you toss for it? <laughs> Can I, I, I'll come back to the microphone, but I'm a little deaf, so I have to try and look at the A very good question, you know, um, uh, responsibility to protect in the Libyan case worked. Uh, resolution through the Security Council. Uh, the Russians, Chinese abstained. I think the South Africans abstained. They shouldn't have, but they did. That's my own personal South African view. Um, and a resolution was passed which gave NATO the right to use a no-fly zone, but it had very strict provision. You had to be very careful and not to uh, engage in the killing of civilians, either by design or by accident. Almost impossible to carry that out, but at least uh, the resolution uh, insisted on it, which was, I think, sensible enough. Um, but why not a similar resolution on Darfur? Why not similar resolutions on Zimbabwe? Again, I come back to Paddy Ashdown. I think the constraints on intervention in those two cases in the politicians I, mind, simply outweigh the incentives. I mean, <laughs> you know, Britain wants always, I think rightly, this is my own personal view, prejudice, wants to punch above its weight in international politics. We want to be here, there, and everywhere upholding all sorts of great principles in international relations, also defending our economic interests, quite rightly, as you say or suggest. And yet, we allow our Minister of Defense to cut back our defense capabilities to a very, very narrow spectrum of available capability, you know. I mean, there was an article in the paper a day or two ago, or a piece on the radio, which said that one of the ships we sent to patrol the Mediterranean around Libya during the crisis had four missiles that's all. 
four anti-aircraft missiles. You should have had, I think, a dozen at least. There weren't enough missiles. So once you've exhausted your four, you're open to <laughs> destruction from the air or from the land. And, you know, that, that struck me as sad because, you know, if you really are going to defend, assert human rights and use military intervention as an instrument where you can, when you can, if you can get over the constraints and take the incentives uh, as your rule of play, then, frankly, you've got to have capability to do it. And I'm astonished that a conservative administration, admittedly a coalition, uh, which has always prided itself on its capacity for defense of the realm. You know, that's a great conservative principle in this country. We are there, the military are there to defend the crown. We take an oath to defend the crown, to defend the military, uh, to defend the government, defend the realm. And I think it's becoming increasingly difficult for Britain to defend the realm, to intervene in this dramatic way that it did in Libya. Whether we can do it again is anybody's guess. But there we are. I hope that tries to answer your question. I think I go back to Ashdown. We couldn't do anything in Darfur. The African Union would never have agreed to it, nor would the Arab League have agreed to it. Um, the African Union won't agree to intervention in Zimbabwe. I mean, the South African government follows a policy of soft power, uh, of um, soft, uh, what do they call it, quiet diplomacy to try and bring about change. Well, that may be the only alternative. But military intervention on our part, in Darfur, in Zimbabwe, I don't think those possibilities exist for all sorts of reasons, good and bad. I'll leave it at that. Yes? Yes, uh, um, you, you said something about leaving it to the local. You, well, yeah, that's one view. As perhaps a good view. Um, yeah. But that, that um, for some of us who teach international law, yeah. that will give us a difficult that would make it difficult for us to explain to the students who want to study international law the efficacy of international law at all. Because when you come to a, a situation where the people um, who are facing serious um, abuses at home are looking up to the international community for help, and then we say, oh no, we can't do anything, leave it to the people. Tells them that international law doesn't work. For instance, the responsibility to prevent and punish genocide yeah. is an obligation and government. And therefore, when world leaders begin to consider national interest and all the show of your part kind of thing, it leaves those who perpetrate genocide, it gives them a free hand to continue. Because no one wants to jump on to stop it, to punish it, to fulfill their obligation under international law. And, and therefore, it, it makes the work of teaching this subject too difficult. Uh, what do you say? You're a teacher, is actually. Yes, sir. Um, no, I, 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 I take that point. I'll go back here. Um, I do, I do take that point. I mean, international law, I'm afraid, is often more honored again in the breach than the observance, because ultimately, uh, states will make decisions on these matters, ultimately, I suppose, in realist terms, in terms of their own conception of the national interests. Now, let me put this to you. There's nothing, I think, wicked or immoral in asserting the need to defend a national interest. I mean, we live in a world which is anarchic, there's no central authority capable of adjudicating between uh, conflicting states. So states have to look to their own resources, their own power, to protect themselves. Um, and that may involve, as it does, you're quite right, it may involve ignoring the claims uh, of international law. I mean, there will be occasions when terrible things happen in distant parts of the world, which slip below the radar screen of governments and NGOs where national interest clearly has no reason to get involved or to intervene. And I'm afraid that is simply a fact of life. Nonetheless, your point is well taken, nonetheless, international law, despite the fact that it's often breached or ignored, still stands as a standard. States have to think twice, even three times, before they decide <coughs> 
to do something which breaches international law. It's a International law in one level is a set of norms. You know this better than I do. I'm not an international lawyer. Is a set of norms which states are meant to abide by. And that's progress of a sort that somehow in this anarchical society, a mixture of very different political cultures and peoples and governments, there is that standard of legal behavior which increasingly states have to pay attention to, partly because their publics now are putting pressure on those states to obey or take seriously what international law has to say. Um, that, I think, is, is, is a big change in international relations, the involvement of peoples, their capacity to influence outcomes, which 30, 50, 60 years ago wasn't the case. And law stands as a standard. You may break it, you may want to break it, you may feel you have no alternative but to break it, but you've got to think once, twice, three times about doing so. And that, that's <laughs> modest progress of a kind. I hope I've answered your question to some degree. I think I had better stop there. I mean, Mark is getting... <laughs> well. I'll just say a few words of thanks in the microphone so we get those too. I just want to take this opportunity again to express our gratitude, Professor Spence. It's an honor to finally have the chance to meet you in person, and I think you really assisted us greatly today with your, your keynote address. So thank you very much. Maybe a second round of applause for Professor Spence. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I've much enjoyed it. Thank you for your very good questions. I wish you all well.